Well, ladies and gentlemen, once again, it's time to go inside EMS. I am your host, Chris Sabalero, Kelly Grayson, once again on the EMS World Tour, bringing education and knowledge, developing the skills and abilities of the EMS providers around the United States. We look forward to having him back next week. But you can see, if you're watching us on video, I have a great guest for you. He's been a friend of the show since the beginning. He is the chief of Champaign, Illinois Fire Department, and we are going to talk about what's going on down there in Memphis, Tennessee. But Gary, uh, Chief Gary Ludwig, I want to thank you for joining us on the show. Hey, Chris, it's always great to be with you, and I'm always honored to come on the show. I, I listen to you uh immensely you and Kelly and it's just so informative so such an honor to be here with you I wanted to ask can we make you the president of the Chris and Kelly fan club oh I would take it in a heartbeat okay and, awesome uh, but uh, but I, I would think I'd have many competitors because I think a lot of people want to have that role so right, that's probably true that's probably true Gary but you know Gary one of the things that I think you wrote a great article last week and we know what's coming out of memphis tennessee and you've been involved with that agency for over 10 years as a deputy chief uh you know before you transition to your current role and you wrote a great article that really kind of uh you know covers a lot of things that really kind of talks about you know let's not let's not pass judgment on a whole department because those of a few i mean we know what happened in springfield illinois and we're kind of talking about the same things where you know there's a couple of emts that uh, you know uh, are being accused of murder and we saw those videos and and you really kind of talk about this from a from a global issue and i, I want to touch on it with your experience but i think first when you, when you saw what came out of memphis being so close to that community being so close to the firefighters and paramedics that worked there, understanding their professionalism. What what was your first thought? Um, I had a range of emotions, quite frankly, Chris. Uh, you know, I, I I invested 10 years of my life in that department as a deputy fire chief, actually running the EMS system, and uh, have many friends and many acquaintances still there. I watched the caliber of the firefighters over the years, the chief officers, the company officers, I, I know the professionalism that is in that department, as it is in many other fire departments and EMS agencies. And so it was disturbing to me uh, to see it because that's the system uh, that I helped develop there. There were some challenges when I came there and and with a lot of other people, we made some vast improvements. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I knew the caliber of the people there. And so it was disturbing, but it was also, um, you know, uh, to my mind, something that was not reflective of the caliber and the EMS and fire agencies around the United States. Yeah, and I want to touch on this just a little bit, because your article, Remember What You Witnessed, Memphis is a Wake-Up Call for Emergency Services, um, and you kind of talk about your experience with the Memphis Fire Department. You know, I think that there's a couple things that I want to kind of point out here and get your expertise on, is that from the, uh, in you know, the Illinois incident, from the Memphis incident, you know, and you kind of mentioned it in your article that, you know, these cameras are everywhere now. And I don't really understand, and I've questioned this before, that uh, the cameras were rolling and people know that the cameras are rolling and this is still the behavior. Is it that we've gotten so benign to, uh, you know, treating people with compassion that we don't care who's looking anymore? No, I, I think... My theory on this, Chris, is this normalization of deviance. We we behave on these cameras inappropriately. Nothing happens to us. You go on the next call, you know there's cameras there, body cameras, security cameras, ring doorbells. I got ring cameras outside my home. Uh, there's cameras everywhere. People with phones have cameras. And so um, we go on this, we behave inappropriately. We do things and there's no consequences, even though it was captured on camera. So it becomes normalized. This deviant behavior becomes normalized to do this in front of cameras until that one time, just like a roulette wheel, the cameras come up wrong and it shows up on CNN or Fox or MSNBC. And I think that's I think that's the key to what happens is normalization of deviance. Yeah, and I think that's a really a great way to put that. And as you say in your article, which I thought was a a, a great analogy, it's like a football play, fourth and inches. And then, you know, when we have to see, did we make it? We're rolling it back. We're going forward, frame at a time. And, and you know, I, and I think one of the things that I want to compare that to is we don't know the next call that we run isn't going to be national news. 
And we have to stop thinking about that our small town of Springfield, Illinois, or Memphis, Tennessee, or Ferguson, Missouri, is just uh, that small town. That could be where the next national news story is coming from. And I think we have to remember that. It is. And it's so absolutely true. And I, I can't emphasize enough to your listeners, there are cameras everywhere. Uh, I, I, I Google this and, and the average person gets seen on a camera about 54 times a day. Wow. And if you think about, you know, you walk into a supermarket, you know, they got you on camera, walk into a bank, you drive through an intersection, there might be cameras there. Memphis has thousands and thousands of cameras scattered throughout the city. And what you saw from that sky cop, uh, that was being transmitted back to what they call the real time crime center. It's a huge room with hundreds of computer monitors that monitor thousands of cameras throughout the city. And if you watch that camera, it's pointed up the street. And if you watch, since at some point, there's like headlights that come on on the right bottom corner. And those cameras are programmed that when they catch motion, they turn. And it alerts the people in the real-time center that there's motion somewhere. And a lot of times it's benign. And, uh, you know, they go to the next camera screen and look and see what's going on. But they, as that camera turns, you'll watch it doesn't really center on the activity. And then somebody in the real time crime center moves the camera a little bit and centers on, on the activity that's going on. So my point being is there's thousands of cameras in some of these cities. Yeah. Uh, and so just assume that you're always going to be on camera no matter what. And don't forget that your mm -hmm. actions, as we said, like on fourth and fourth and inches, um, when you see the TV announcers on TV, the broadcast announcers at these NFL games, they're going to look at it from all kinds of different angles from up above their drones on the field and the cameras that are on the goal line. And, and they're going to analyze it and they're going to pick it apart. And uh, you don't have that luxury with the split second decisions that you have to make sometimes. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. And it's just amazing now, um, you know, where we are and, and uh, you know, what we're being, what's how we're being seen. But I think one of the things that I want to ask you as well, I want to shift gears a little bit and you and I have been a student of leadership for some time, your EMS articles on leader uh, or your leadership articles that we've read in EMS for years. You know, I couldn't wait every month to see what Gary Ludwig was going to write. But um, did when we back to you, Chris? Thanks. But when we think about this from the standpoint of leadership in organizations, and we do our best, I think, to set policy, and we do our best to set practice, and we do our best to give pride to the – but once they leave us, it's the moment of truth, that they have to be able to to take that, you know? But but what, what do we do as leaders here? Is this a leadership issue? Is this, you know, again, you talk about normalization of deviance, but how does that – you know, I, I think I'm babbling. I think you get the idea of where the question yeah. is going, Chief, but, I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I sometimes I think we can blame leadership. Because it does start at the top. It starts with the attitudes that are developed at the top of the organization. Um, but a lot of times um, it has to do with how we hire people. Um, you know, I, I I think back to Gordon Graham, as many people probably listening to this know who Gordon Graham is. He's, he's a risk management guru. Yeah. You know, he, he stresses repeatedly that you have to pre-screen your employees. You know, but their past behavior at another agency is going to be reflective of how they're going to be in your organization. When I worked in St. Louis, I had a fire chief that would mentor me on a lot of things. And one of the things he taught me was that the best you will ever see one of your employees is at the interview. That's the best you ever see. Then once they get hired, they tick down a little bit from there. Once they get through into probation or through the academy, they tick down a little bit there. Once they're in their probation, they tick down a little bit there. And then once they get through their probation, that's probably about the level of how they're going to perform. And they may even go down further from there if they get burned out. So it's incumbent upon us as leaders to try to prevent burnout, to try to rotate our employees, to try to get some other programs in place to make sure that we're not burning out our employees and make sure those attitudes are exemplary. Um, there was an ambulance service out in Colorado, Colorado some years ago. And I remember their hiring practice, it was a private agency, was they hired strictly on attitude. Southwest Airlines does that. Strictly hired on attitude and the thought process, we want the right attitude because we're in the customer service business, and then we'll teach you the skills. Right. And I think that that's a great way to do that. As you mentioned, <clears throat> in this great resignation in the quiet quitting era, you know, in, in you know, uh, trying to put as many butts in the seats. 
that could very well be the, uh, you know, the challenge is that we have no choice but to take what's coming through the door. But again, as you mentioned, and Kelly says this all the time, you know, we can train you skill, but I, I can't teach you compassion. And I think he's really right. You know, one of the things that you talk about in your article is, and I want to go ahead and, and touch on this, because you talk about the role of the company officer, but I want to go ahead and put this into the perspective of the roles of the paramedics that are there as well. And I knew that I was talking with you today, we were going to have the show, and I was thinking about this, how... You know, a lot of times the way that we work is, and you, you've you been in EMS for a long time and the fire service for a long time, you know, so have I. And we've seen the behavior of, of the police and how they have to go about their job or how they think they have to go about their job. When do we have the right to step in as EMS providers or as company officers or as firefighters to intervene with the police to say, this may not be the right thing to do guys. Cause usually we wait back until they say the scene is safe. Come on in. But maybe we need to stop doing that when it comes to issues like this to say, all right, let me get in here. I, I would agree. Um, you know, the, the thought process that they're not your patient until the police gets done. That is not true. You have a duty to act. If you're on scene and you see someone being brutalized you see somebody use of force is beyond where it should be. In my opinion, you have a duty to act. Um, otherwise, you're just like any other law enforcement officer standing there watching it. And uh, that's my opinion. And it always has been my opinion. Uh, you know, we, it's not only a professional opinion, uh, our professional attitude we should have. It's a human factor. Yeah. You know, you, 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 we just, the whole concept of, and I agree, sometimes the use of force is required, but officers have been trained how to escalate that up you know it doesn't start off with a brutal attack it's an escalation of use of force but uh we have a duty to act in my opinion when it comes to treating someone um in an inhumane or unprofessional manner by another another person whether it be a paramedic or whether it would be a, a law enforcement officer or a firefighter yeah I, I a nurse you're... Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. I mean, Chief, so I, 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 I know how you work and we've talked, you know, we're very close. We've talked throughout the years when something like this happens, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm sure you have the ability to, to share expertise and, and you talk to your firefighters up there and you talk to your company officers as this transpired. And as you were kind of getting the feel for what's happening here, how did you relay this to your folks to say, you know, here's the lessons here. And, and that's what you're trying to do with this article for everybody, right? Is you're yes. saying, let's not, let's not point fingers. We know what's happened. We've seen it. Um, but let's learn from this. And that's, I think, why we're talking about it. What, what, what were you sharing with them? So I, it's been anecdotal conversations at this point, but I will tell you, I've told my training officer to carve some time out for me when we do EMS training, that I want to have some time with my firefighters and we're going to watch this videotape, and I'm going to show them exactly what happened. Uh, the fact that the, it, which you don't see on the videotape, that the company officer and the driver are sitting about a block. Some people have told me two blocks away in an engine that never came down to the scene. Now, one could argue the driver needs to stay with the engine, but the officer should have got out of the vehicle and came down. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about your duty to act including what I just spoke about. If you see someone being brutalized unnecessarily, you have a duty to step in. And, and you can do that in a, a very roundabout, coy way. Uh, like, hey, 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 let me talk to this guy. Let me, hold on, hold on. Try to get them to stop and at least intervene in some way instead of how and stop. There are different ways of getting that to stop. And we're gonna talk about your duty to act, your duty to take care of the patient. Um, and then uh, we're going to also talk about the fact there are, we just talked about, Chris, there are cameras everywhere. But I'm, I'm one of the things I'm also going to stress, Chris, is documentation. I see a lot of reports. I see when I worked in other departments, such as Memphis, St. Louis, when I see stuff around the country, these engine companies are first responders. They show up. They might take care of the patient medically for eight to 10 minutes. And then they go back and they write the report. And what did they put in the narrative? See ambulance report. Right. Or they put very little. You know, a lawyer going back and looking at that can look at the times and go, well, you know, um, firefighter or paramedic Smith, you were on the scene 
for 11 minutes before the ambulance showed up and I don't see where you did anything. Right. And you may have done a whole host of things, a whole myriad of things, but if you don't document it, it looks like you did nothing. And if it's not on camera, chances are it may be on camera, but if it's not on camera, you know, you're sunk. You look like you did nothing. So I can't stress documentation enough. These first response companies, and I see it all over the country, are terrible at documenting what care they did prior to the ambulance arrival. I actually had one more question for you, Chief, but I think you just opened up a Pandora's box to find a can of worms. Uh, I'm going to give you two more. But I, I think when you talk about documentation, one of the things that you and I were talking about before we got started is uh, we were talking about the Springfield, Illinois uh, incident. And we said, what is that documentation going to look like when, the, mm -hmm. by the time they get to the hospital, you know, was there 120 over 80 vital signs and pulse was 80 and respirations were 20. And um, another thing isn't the documentation to make sure it's detailed, but not to falsify that documentation. Yeah. Because now when we talk about these cases, um, is what they wrote in the report exactly what happened as they scrutinized fourth and inches? Well, that's right. Yeah, I mean, you could line them up parallel next to each other, the videotape and the patient care report. And if it doesn't match, you're going to have a tough time explaining that to a jury. And uh, and so you're absolutely right, Chris. You've got to be accurate and truthful with your documentation. You cannot falsify. Falsification of a legal document? We're talking about falsification of a legal document, not just plagiarism or or anything of you know that or those school terms we're talking about falsification of a medical legal document pretty serious stuff so chief you know what i wanted to think about is <clears throat> we're starting to see all these you know uh, body cams from cops that are really kind of scrutinizing their um behavior how they're dealing with the public and you know in EMS we kind of follow the suits of what's happening around us is it time for EMS to start to wear body cameras as well for our own liability, as well as do we need to put a camera in the back of the compartment for, uh, well, not just telemedicine, which is big, because <clears throat> we may not transport people, but we may be able to, but really for the work that we did in the ambulance. And, you know, a lot of people will talk about, you know, uh, HIPAA, blah, blah, blah. But when we see this now, EMS providers are getting scrutinized. EMS providers are now getting charged because of what's happening around them and doing things they may not do. Do we got to consider this from a, a liability standpoint, not only for our agency, but more importantly, to protect our employees? You know, that's a great question, Chris. I'm going to tell you that uh, I was in the camp at one time, like there's no way we're putting cameras in the back of ambulances and we're putting cameras on our paramedics. There's no way we're ever going to do that. And, and the more I look at this, I'm thinking, you know what? I saw what it's done for the police. I don't know how many police officers have been saved on accusations um, where in the past there's been no video of it. It's just the accusation of a witness on what they saw. And, and it's amazing uh, that people see something, you can have different versions of it. But the cameras don't lie. But it's amazing how many officers have been saved. And I will also say it's, it's amazing how many citizens probably have received professionalism at a higher level from an officer. Because if you watch some of these cameras on YouTube of these officer encounters, it's, it is amazing how ugly the citizen is to the officer. But the officer's just as nice as can be and very professional. And I just wonder how the officer would be if there was no camera on. Yeah. So... The same will be true for us. <clears throat> How nice will we be when we encounter that patient that is ugly to us, that family member that's ugly to us, that bystander that is ugly to us? How nice will we be compared to if we didn't have a camera on? And you know what I'm talking about, Chris. We yeah. both came from the streets. You, you ran the, the system there uh, at, in St. Louis and North St. Louis County. You know, and, and, and if people don't know that you were managing that system during the Ferguson riots, right. which is, um, you know, quite a feather in your hat, the, the way you manage that. But um, so and, and then we get into the issue of patient care and in uh, documentation of that. So I I was in that camp one time of I don't, I don't think so. But now I'm starting to really lean towards not only cameras in the back of the ambulance, but 
cameras up front that were pointing out also um, for auto accidents. Yeah, that's and, a great uh, point. Yeah, and I've seen that. I uh, unfortunately have also seen some cameras that are pointed into the cab, and I've seen a couple of videotapes where, um, as we know, sleep deprivation is a terrible issue within EMS. Yeah. And uh, you know, I've seen videotapes of people driving ambulances uh, that are actually nodding off, yeah. sleep, nodding off, and you know that can work against you. But but maybe that will hold the the leaders accountable. That you got to do something about sleep deprivation. You you can't work your people at these extreme levels and, and think you're going to have superior performance. Right. I agree. And, you know, uh, you, you, you talk about that, sorry to cut you off, but you know, one of my leadership clients is uh, an Amazon distributor. So the, the blue vans that you see running around the city, they're not yeah. owned by Amazon. They're independently owned. And one of my clients owns a company that delivers for Amazon. But when you talk about that from a liability standpoint, I can't I can't stress to you it's it's probably weekly Gary that people will say that Amazon hit my car and Amazon um it was the, this accident and they're looking for the big windfall yeah. from Amazon and then they have those cameras that are truly protecting the drivers to say you you look at it and you say they're nowhere near this car they they you know it wasn't even there you know what I mean so when you talk about protecting um, the organization or, and protecting the individual. I mean, I got to tell you nine times out of 10 that I've seen, there's been no liability on the side of the agency. And I think you bring that up from a great, I got to think that EMS is going to be the same. And the fire is going to be the same that people are looking at the city coffers to say, I'm going to get myself a new car here. Yeah. I, I, it, yeah, you're right. They're looking at those deep pockets. People who sue also are looking at government has deep pockets but Amazon, that's that's interesting. I have seen videos, and I don't think I've seen any videos from Amazon, where say let's just, let's just, I, let's just hypothetically say the Amazon truck is sitting at a red light, and I've seen videos, again, it, uh, where someone's walking in the crosswalk in front of them, and all of a sudden falls over into the truck and then falls on the ground as though they've been hit by the uh, by that's the right. truck. Have you seen any of those videos? No, I have seen them. You're, you're absolutely right. They they have, man. And um, But even, I, I just want to point out, I don't know if you've seen recently, and I know we're kind of getting off topic here, but it, it goes to the topics of saving the cameras. Um, and this just happened uh, uh, last week where two individuals got into the Amazon truck and robbed it at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. And you can see, actually, and, and look it up, Gary, it'll be interesting. Um, they walk into the cab while the driver's sitting in the driver's seat, point the gun at him, take his wallet, and then steal all the packages from, but it's all on camera. But anyway, um, I think it just goes to the point of saying, again, as we started this discussion, cameras are everywhere. Uh, not only will it uh, hurt us, but it could help us as well. But, uh, you know, I know I want to be respectful of your time, Gary. I know you've got a lot of uh, responsibility up there. It's always great to talk to you. This is our 10th year of Inside EMS. And I was going back and you started with us as a guest on the second year, by the way, wow. uh, as we start to look at that. So uh, you've been a friend of the show for a long time. And we look forward to you coming back and joining us again. I just, I, and I, I'm not just saying it because I'm here with you, Chris. I love listening to you guys every Friday when the new show comes out. It is so informative. I love the banter between you and Kelly and some of your other guests. And it's just, you do a fabulous and incredible job, you and Kelly both. And so, uh, again, just kudos to you. And thanks for putting on such a tremendous informative show. No, thank you, Chief. And, uh, you know, for everybody out there, I mean, everybody's got an opinion about this. You know, I think the I think the question we want to hang on the line right now is EMS body cams, you know, EMS cams in the in the in the patient compartment. As the chief mentioned, you know, ca uh, cameras in the front. Are we getting to the point? You know, we, we talked about body armor for the long time and that body armor will never happen. But it seems that that's becoming a staple now. So yes. as we think about what the future of EMS looks like, is this a time now that body that body cams and and, you know, compartment cams are going to become the normal? I, I want to hear your thoughts, your comments and concerns about this. Go ahead and send us an email at the show at EMS1.com for Kelly Grayson and Chief Gary Ludwig. I'm Chris Sabalero, and we'll chat with everyone again next week.